ערב טוב, קהל נכבד, שוש, יונתן, רוני, בני משפחת יובל היקרים. Special greetings to our guest, keynote lecturer this evening, Professor Susan Nyman. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. I'm speaking in English, although I have been told that your Hebrew is superb. Uh, yeah. Superb. I'm going to open the Kenes. אני מתכבד לפתוח את הכנס עם השם המדויק כל כך, מודרניות, תבונה וסופיות, כנס לכבודו ולזכרו של פרופסור ירמיהו יובל במלאת שנה, שנה ויום למותו. איש היה בישראל. ירמיהו יובל, פרופסור ירמיהו יובל, ירי בפי חבריו. איש גדול מנפילי הארץ הזאת, אוהב חוכמה, מורה החוכמה ומפיצה ברבים. אדם מחויב לרעיונות ולכוחם של רעיונות בעולם. לא הכרתי את ירמיהו יובל באופן אישי, בעוונותיי, אבל הערכתי אליו במובן הזה אינה תלויה בדבר. שמו הילך קסם ויראה עליי ועל בני דורי, ועוד ימשיך להלך שנים רבות. אני מכיר אותו מספריו, מתרגומיו ומביאוריו. על ביאוריו, הערות השוליים שנתלוו לתרגומים המפוארים, ניתן לומר קוטנו עבה ממותניהם של רבים. אני זוכר לילות ארוכים שבהם רכנתי על למשל ההקדמה לפנומולוגיה של הרוח בתרגומו ובהערותיו של ירמיהו יובל ובמשפט אחד או שניים הוא הצליח להתיר פסקה סבוכה בפסגות דלילות החמצן והשירות הרוח שאליהם הוא הוביל ידעתי שאני בידיים אמונות ופתוחות ירמיהו יובל היה עבור דורנו מה שהוגו ברגמן ונתן רוטנשטרייך, האבות המייסדים של הפילוסופיה העברית, היו עבור דורם. פילוסוף מקורי, מתרגם לשפת עבר ומורה. מתערב בשיחותיהם של קאנט, הגל, ניטשה ושפינוזה כמובן, באותה נינוחות שבה היה מעורב עם הבריות. משוחח עם הפילוסופים של העבר בצלילות, בבהירות ובעמקות, כפי ששוחח עם תלמידיו ועם הציבור הישראלי. עם כל ישראל, גם בכף וגם בקוף על שם העבר שלו בכל ישראל בתחנת השידור. פרופסור יובל, פרופסור לפילוסופיה באוניברסיטה העברית בירושלים, בניו סקול בניו יורק, חתן פרס ישראל. מורשתו החשובה כאן לנו במכון ון ליר, עם מכון שפינוזה שהקים לפני למעלה משלושים שנה, שממשיך לפרוח כיום כמרכז שפינוזה במכון ון ליר. הוא מקדם כנסי מחקר וכנסים בפילוסופיה לציבור הרחב. שאלת השאלות מיהו האדם וחידת הסופיות האנושית, נושא הכנס, העסיקה את ירמיהו יובל רבות. השאלה זכתה לדיון מיוחד בספרו שפינוזה וחופרים אחרים. הספר על שני חלקיו, דיפטיך, ממקם את שפינוזה מחד בתוך הקשרו ההיסטורי ומאידך באופן שבו התרים הוגים מאוחרים יותר. ביסודו עוסק הספר, כזכור לכולנו, בפילוסופיה האימננטית הכופרת בטרנסדנציה, ולאורכו של הספר מראה יובל כיצד כל הוגה בדרכו שלו, שפינוזה, קאנט, הגל, ניטשה, אחרים, פתחו, פיתחו פילוסופיה הכופרת בטרנסדנציה של האל, של הדעת האנושית, של אידאות ואידיאלים השוכנים מעבר לעולם. יובל, בצלילות שאין לה מתחרים, מציג את גישותיהם של הוגי אידאות מגוונים ואינו נמנע מלשלב לצד ההוגים גם את רעיונותיו. וכן לאורך הספר ובמיוחד בסופו מתחדדת משנתו ודרכו הפילוסופית ואולי גם הקיומית. בסופו של יום אין גאולה מחוץ לעולם וקונטרה שפינוזה, קאנט והגל שביקשו למצוא בתוך העולם האימננטי טרנסנדנציה בטבע בדבר כשהוא לעצמו ברוח המוחלטת אצל יובל העולם נדמה כאימננטי לפני ולפנים. לא רק האדם הוא סופי המציאות עצמה שותפה לסופיותו של האדם. 
כשם שהפילוסופיה הנאו-פלוטונית היא באינסופיות האלוהית מאצילה מעצמה על העולם, כך אצל יובל נדמה שהסופיות האנושית מעצימה מעצמה על העולם והופכת גם אותו לסופי. האדם הוא מידת הדברים, סופיותו היא סופיותם. ואני לסיום רוצה לצטט פסקה אחת מתוך הספר. בסיכום, האדם כייצור פעיל ומחולל הוא רלוונטי מבחינה ישותית לכל משמעות וצביון שרוחש לו העולם, מכיוון שמשמעות גם אובייקטיבית יכולה לנבוע רק מבני אדם. מי שמייחס משמעות לישות כשהיא לעצמה נכשל באינוש באנתרופופורמיזם לא פחות ממי שמייחס לה תכליות. אם דברים אלו עלולים להישמע כביטוי להיבריס כדאי שנזכור כי למעשה הם דווקא ביטוי לסופיות האדם. חוסר היכולת לחרוג מגבולות האימננטיות הוא מקור לרגשי נמיכות ובדידות אונתולוגית אשר מתוך התגברות עצמית עשויים להוליד גם תחושה של חירות וגאווה פורטה. אני מודה לכל המעורבים בארגון הכנס והערב, לדוקטור דרור ינון ודוקטור פיני איפרגן. הנושאים ממשיכים לשאת את לפיד מרכז שפינוזה ואחראים גם על ארגון הכנס, לשולמית לרון מנהל את הפעילות לציבור במכון, לדוקטור טל כוכבי, ראש ההרצאה לאור והעורכת הראשית במכון ון ליר, לשמעון אלון, מנכ"ל המכון. אני מתכבד uh, להזמין את uh, בנו של ירמיהו יובל, את פרופסור יונתן יובל, ממשיך דרכו ביותר ממובן אחד, אפשר לומר, חוקר מקורי ופורה, בעל רוחב יריעה, שלפחות בתחומים שאני מצוי בהם, אין שני לו, סופר ומשורר מוכשר, יונתן אל תסמיק. אני תכף מסיים, מתרגם, קולגה מהפקולטה למשפטים בחיפה וחבר, נושא דברים בשם המשפחה, תודה. ערב טוב. בהתחלה כשדרור פנה אליו ושאל אם אני ארצה להגיד כמה מילים, אז התשובה שלי הייתה מאוד פשוטה, אמרתי לא. אמרתי מילה אחת, בהצלחה. לפני שנתיים בערך ישבתי עם ירי ערב אחד בברביזון, שוחחנו, אני לא זוכר בדיוק על מה. נדמה לי שהוא היה משועשע מתרגום אחד מספריו שהגיע פתאום ללא התראה בדואר, כרך נאה ומאיר עיניים, מודפס על נייר מצוין, רק לא ידענו באיזה שפה זה. היה קוריאנית או יפנית, לא היה כתוב שם שום דבר בשפה שמישהו מאיתנו הכיר, רק האות Y הופיע שם פעמים רבות, מכיוון שבשפות אוריינטליות רבות הפונם Y לא קיים. ולכן צריך להשתמש באות הלטינית. ואז הוא אמר אגב אורחה, מה שהפתיע אותי מאוד, הוא אמר, תוך שהוא מחזיק ביד שלו את הספר, הוא אמר שהוא בעצם לא מחשיב כל כך את הכתיבה. שהוא רואה את עצמו בעיקר כאדם אוראלי, כך הוא אמר, איש של שיחה ושל מפגש ולא של ייצור טקסטואלי. אני הסתכלתי בו בדי בתדהמה, ובמדף שמאחוריו, שאז מעשרות ספריו בתרגומים לשלל שפות, קאנט וחידוש המטאפיזיקה והפילוסופיה של ההיסטוריה וספינוזה וכופרים אחרים וחידה אפלה על נצ'ה והיהודים והנוסים והתרגומים לפנולוגיה של הרוח של הגל ולאתיקה ולביקורת התבונה הטהורה והמאמרים והפולמוסים והסתכלתי על כל זה והוא אמר כן יש גבול לכמה אנשים אפשר להגיע כשמדברים איתם מגיעים אליהם בהכרח דרך הכתיבה או השידור הרי מרבית הקוראים הללו אין לי גישה אליהם וחלק גדול מהם עדיין אינם קיימים יום אחד בעוד עשרים שנה תלמידה תיכון תגיע במקרה לאחד הטקסטים האלה ודרכו היא תתחבר עם התודעה שיצרה אותו. יש את האמירה הידועה הזו של דרידה שעושה את ההבחנה הרדיקלית בין טקסט ובין התודעה של היוצר שלו. אנחנו יכולים, אנחנו נפגשים בטקסטים באופן שהוא מנותק מהתודעה שיצרה אותם, לפעמים אנחנו לא יודעים מי יצר אותם ובכל מקרה אנחנו לא מחשיבים נורא את היוצר בטח לא ברמנואיטיקה המודרנית וזה, חשבתי על זה כשדיברתי איתו, הוא הכיר לי את הסופר הדרום אפריקאי הגדול קוצי בזמנו, כשהוא קרא כתב את מחכים לברברים, נירי נתן לי את הספר וקוצי בספר חדש יחסית באליזבת קוסטלו 
שואל שאלה שמישהו כמוני לא יכול לשאול, כי זה נשמע נורא לא פוליטיקלי קורקט, אבל סופר אפריקאי יכול לשאול דבר כזה, יכול להשתמש באוצר מילים כאלה, הוא שואל למה, למה באפריקה אין יותר רומנים אפריקאים? למה אין, אין רומנים? הסוגה של הרומן בעולם החדש מאוד, מאוד תפסה, תחשבו על ארצות הברית, כן? ברגע שהרומן הגיע לארצות הברית, אז ארצות הברית נכסה אותו לגמרי, אמריקה, לא רק ארצות הברית, אמריקה הלטינית נכסה לגמרי ג'אנר הרומן, ובאפריקה יש מעט מאוד רומנים. הוא כותב את זה, הוא אומר, שואל את השאלה הזו בעצמו בתור נובליסט אה, אפריקאי, אה, והתשובה שהוא נותן, ואני יכול לומר, אומרים שמביא דברים בשם אה, עומרה מביא אה, גאולה לעולם, לא משהו שאני יכול כמובן לחוות עליו דעה עצמאית, והוא אומר שלאפריקן מיינד, כן, הכי לא פוליטיקלי קורק שיש, פיין, לאפריקן מיינד, it doesn't make sense מה שדרידה אמר, it doesn't make sense שיש לכם טקסט ואין לכם את המספר. כי הסיפור לא עומד בפני עצמו. הסיפור הוא אמצעי להתחבר דרכו לאנושיות של מספר הסיפורים, של הסטורי טלר. ולכן האפריקאי דורש את הנוכחות של הסטורי טלר שמה. הסיפור הוא רק אמצעי. צריך להתחבר לאנושיות שלו, לפגמים שלו, לזמניות שלו. זה תמיד אירוע חד פעמי, ואף פעם לא יחזור על עצמו. הפרפורמנס לא יחזור על עצמו באותם, באותם צורות. חשבתי על זה כשאני קורא את ירי, אני הרבה פעמים חי על המתח הזה. הוא כתב, הוא כתב המון, אבל הקול שלו תמיד שמה. אי אפשר להתבלבל. אני לפחות לא יכול להתבלבל. זה לא משנה מה אני קורא, אם אני חוזר וקורא איזה שהן כתבות עיתונאיות מהפובליציסטיקה המאוד מאוד אה, עשירה שלו, שהתחילה בשנות, ה, אה, שהתחילה בשנות ה-70, בתקופת תנועות המחאה. אה, והמשיכה עד זמן קצר, דרך אגב, לא רק בעיתונות הישראלית, בעיתונות הצרפתית, האמריקאית. בשבילי הקול הספציפי שלו תמיד שם, או אם אני קורא טקסט בפילוסופיה, מה שאני עושה בעוונותיי לא מספיק. וזה מחבר אותנו קצת לכנס הזה, כי אבא ש... ירי, חוץ מאת אימא שלי, הדבר שהוכי אוהב בעולם זה שיחה טובה. רעיונות הפרו אותו וריתקו אותו, לא רק אינטלקטואלית, אלא גם אסתטית וחושנית. היה לו ארס, ארוס וליבידו שהתפרסו על מגוון היצירה האנושית. אבל הם עניינו אותו מכיוון שהם היו אנושיים, מכיוון שהם היו הפירות הבלתי מושלמים, הפגומים, הנפלאים באי שלמותם של תודעות אנושיות ושל תקשורת. הוא היה הרפתקן של אנשים ושל מפגשים. הוא מביא אותם לפעמים הביתה. אספן כזה, ואני זוכר אותו לוקח אותנו לשיטוטים בירושלים של ילדותי, נכנסים לכנסיות ומנזרים, <coughs> והוא מדובב נזירים ומבקרים באיטלקית, צרפתית, גרמנית, ולאט לאט, מאיזשהו סוג של רלקטנס לנודניק, הם היו נשבים בקסמו, והשיחות היו מתארחות, והזמן והמקום, ולפעמים גם הילדים, היו נשכחים לפחות לשעה. זו גם אחת הסיבות, אחת מיני רבות, שהוא היה באופנים כל כך עמוקים מורה. לפעמים מורה מסויג ומתלבט בדיוק בגלל שהוא הכיר בטבעה העמוק, המפרה, אבל גם הטרגי של הוראה אמיתית. הקמת מרכז ספינוזה, כיום מרכז ספינוזה במכון ון ליר בירושלים, היה בעיניו אחד מהדברים הכי חשובים שהוא עשה. הקמה, עיצוב וביסוס של מרכז אינטלקטואלי פורס, תוסס ופתוח ומפרה, בתוך חברה שציסות ופתיחות אינטלקטואלית נמצאות בה באתגור מתמיד. ונפלא שהמיזם הזה מצא לו אכסניה ושותפות של אמת במכון ולניר. כאדם מורלי לפי אפיונו שלו, זה בדיוק האירוע שהוא היה רוצה אה, להיות נוכח בו. לא כי ידברו עליו, אלא בגלל הרעיונות. את כל המדברים כאן הכיר, אהב, התפלמס איתם בלי שום חשבון. כתב לי אה, תלמיד שלו לשעבר שהוא פרופסור בקנדה. שלמד אצלו בניו סקול שהוא אמר, הוא אמר, he was the most ten, uh, uh, generous and a little terrifying teacher. Um, אני, הכנס הזה היה, uh, היה נפלא בעיניו, uh, ואני רוצה לומר כמה מילים ובזה אני אסיים לפני ש... Um, כמה מילים של תודות, כי כנסים כאלה לא באים לעולם סתם. אנשים באים ויושבים וזה נראה כאילו הדבר הזה פשוט פתאום צמח. זה לא ככה, אני יודע איזו כמות של מחשבה ומאמץ 
מושקעת בזה. אני רוצה להודות למכון ון ליאו, שהכניס אליו בהכנסת אורחים ובהכנסה ממשית את מכון ספינוזה לפני כעשור, ומאפשר את המשך קיומו והפעילות שלו <coughs> באמצעות מרכז ספינוזה במכון ון ליר. לידידי הוותיק, פרופסור שי לביא, שכל הדברים שהוא אמר עליי חוזר עליך. ראש מכון ון ליר שתמך, גיבה ואפשר את קיום הכנס הזה והרבה הרבה מעבר לו. לשמעון אלון, המנכ״ל, על הסיוע למרכז ספינוזה ועל העמדת הצוות המקצועי של המכון לטובת הכנס ומעבר לכך, לשולמית. לשולמית המסורה, הנפלאה, מנהלת הפעילות לציבור של מכון ון ליר על הארגון, הכנס והפקתו וכל פרט הכי קטן שהיא דאגה לסגור. Uh, בסגירה uh, הרמטית מי ש... Uh, לטל, דוקטור טל כוכבי, העורכת הראשית וראש הוצאת מכון ון ליר, תואר שלא מתחיל לתאר את התרומה שלה כמו סייעת טובה מאחורי, ה, uh, מאחורי הקלעים. וחביבים ולא אחרונים, דוקטור פיני איפרגן ודוקטור דרור ינון, מנהלי מרכז ספינוזה בוון ליר, ואחראים לפעילות האינטלקטואלית השוטפת והמרתקת uh, של המרכז, שיזמו את הכנס. בנו אותו ובנו אותו לתפארה. בתור טוויט, כדי שלא ידברו כאן רק פילוסופיה מופשטת, אני נורא שמח להזמין מי שהייתה כל כך בלתי נפרדת מחייו של ירי, היא קראה כל דבר, כל מילה שהוא כתב היא קראה ראשונה, כל מילה שהיא כתבה הוא כתב ראשון, הוא קרא ראשון. ואימא הסכימה להקריא לנו כמה עמודים מתוך הרומן האחרון שלה, ההזדמנות להתחבק. אני, קורא, קור, אני עומדת לקרוא קטע קטן שנכתב בעצם לפני ארבע שנים, כשכתבתי אותו לא חשבתי בכלל שהוא יהיה רלוונטי בצורה אישית כל כך. וחשבתי שכיוון שהוא היה כל כך מעורב בכתיבה שלי, דרך אגב לא תוך כדי, אלא תמיד בסוף, אבל הקורא הראשון, חשבתי שאולי זה יהיה מתאים שאני אקרא את הקטע הזה. אני אזכיר רק שזה מתחיל בסיומה של מסיבת יום הולדת ושם משפחה של אם, בת שקשורה במשפחה ואביה סביב המחלה של האם. זמן קצר לפני שהאורחים התפזרו, היה רגע בו משה הלר ישב לבדו, בידו ספל קפה, פניו מבוקבצות, ומאיה שניגשה אליו בחיוך, הרצינה כשנשא אליה את פניו. אבא, אני מבין כאילו לראשונה עד כמה היא מחולה, אמר, והעיף מבט סביבו לוודא שאיש אינו מקשיב. מה קרה? מאיה התיישבה על כיסא סמוך וחפנה את כפו הפנויה בידה והוא הניח את ספל הקפה על שולחן קטן לצידו. לא קרה כלום, אבל כל הבריאות החוגגת. לילי שנראית זוהרת, ואימא של עליה, המרד שלה, והמסיבה הזאת שהיא חגיגה לחיים, לספונטניות של עצם הקיום. ומהצד השני, הוא הביט בביתו ולחש במאמץ, אני ממש מרגיש את הזחילה של הסוף, את המערב הזה. אני פוחד שהוא יתממש במפתיע, כמה שלא נתכונן. אבל אבא, מה היה לך שעה נחרדת? אמא, עוד לא. הוא נאנח והם ישבו בשתיקה. ומאיה כבר רצתה להתרומם כשהוא אמר, היום נראה לי כאילו היא מתרחקת, שהיא כבר לא לגמרי איתנו. בוא נחפש אותה, מאיה מלמלה. כן, הוא אמר חרש במצוקת נפש שהם כבר הפסידו אותה, כי כל אותו יום חש בבהירות הולכת ומתחוורת. שלא רק שאילנה מתרחקת מהם, אלא שהיא גולשת לתוך העין. ואומנם, לאחר המסיבה, מצבה של אילנה החל להידרדר במהירות. תוך חודש כבר היה ברור שהפעם תהיה ידה של המחלה על העליונה. 
מראש הוסכם ביניהם שלא יניחו לה לסבול ומינון המורפיום עלה מיום ליום. מרבית הזמן הייתה שקועה בקהות חושים ומאיה ואביה ישבו חליפות ליד מיטתה, הביאו תה מתוק, מרק, אם הנוח לך, טפחו על הקר, ליטפו את הראש ושתקו. ברגעים נדירים כשאילנה פקחה את עיניה, מאיה חיפשה מילים להגיד, להגיד מה היא היססה. אבל לעת ערב היא חשבה, כן, יש מה להגיד, להגיד לה דברים טובים. מחר חשבה, מחר בבוקר, ועיניה נעצמו ונפקחו ונעצמו שוב. בעייפות הכריעה אותה והיא שקעה בשינה מבולבלת. כשהקיצה בבעתה כמתוך סיוט, בעודה משפשפת את עיניה, הבחינה בחשכה המתבהרת בדמותו של אביה עומד למרשות המיטה. אבא, רק עכשיו נכנסתי, משה הלר לחש. מה היה לתשה מבט נפחד במיטה? גם אני נרדמתי, המשיך למלחוש. אמא? כן, הוא אמר. אור צנום חרד חדר מבעד לחרכי התריסים וגילה את מתווה הגוף השכוב ללא נוח. הימהו מכונית בודדת חדר את השקט. מה יהיה? מה היא אמרה כמעט ללא קול. היה לי חבל להעיר אותך ולחש, נראית כל כך מותשת. ובן כה כבר היה מאוחר מדי. גם אני לא הספקתי. הוא השתתק. ומה היה גמגמה? אתה בטוח? כן. והמשיך לבהות במיטה ממלמל, כשנכנסתי היא כבר לא הייתה. ומאיה הניחה את ידה על חזה, נשמה עמוק ולחשה כואב לי. ובתוך הכאב מילאה אותה חרטה צורבת. החמצתי את הרגע. לא הייתי שם. איך החמצתי את זה? כמו בגידה. היה רגע אחד קטן שעוד יכולתי להספיק לראות. לראות בדיוק. לראות איך זה קורה, לראות מה בדיוק קורה. אבל לא הייתי שם. והיא גנחה בקול מרוסק. לא הספקתי להגיד לה עוד פעם שאני אוהבת אותה. לא הספקתי להיפרד ממנה. ומאיה הביטה באביה, שישב על הכיסא בעיניים עצומות, וחשבה, מה הדבר הזה שאנחנו קוראים לו חיות, שכמו באבחת חרף מתעיין פתאום. הלב מפסיק לפעום, הנשימה נעתקת. הגוף נעלם, רק זה? זה כל מה שקורה? האומנם אלה הם כל החיים? השרירים, הדם, העצבים, ומה קורה לנשמה? מה קורה לנפש? מה קורה לאהבה? מתעופפים מחוץ לגוף, מתאדים. והקול, והמגע, והמבט, והמחשבה, פתאום הכל נעלם. כמו בהורדת מתג. והחשיכה משתררת, ואני, איפה אני בכל זה? ימים ולילות אני יושבת כאן, ובסוף הסוף התחמק ממני. <coughs> למה לא נאחזתי בה? למה לא אחזתי בידה? <coughs> וככה הפסדתי את הנזילה האיטית של הקיום אל מה שהוא כבר לא קיום. לא נוכחתי ברגע הפרידה של היש מהעין, את ההתממשות של המוות בכבודו ובעצמו, כי צריך להגיד את המילה. המילה שהיא האמת. אין אמת יותר נחרצת מהמוות. ובתוך שלוות השינה הרגעית לא חשתי שהיד הרזה שכבר לא היה בה כוח חיות כדי לאחוז בי נשמטה לנצח מאחיזתי ולא נשקתי לה ולא חיבקתי אותה ולא נגעתי בשארית, בשארית האחרונה של חייה ומאיה קראה על ברכיה על הרצפה הקרה ונשענה בזרועותיה על המיטה ונטלה את היד הרכה מחוסרת החיים בין שתי כפותיה ונשקה לה נזכרת בקיבוץ לב, בזיכרון שנשאה עמה כל חייה, באותה חוויית אמון של ילדים, כשהייתה מעכבת בידה את היד המלטפת את מצחה. אמא, אל תלכי, אמא, אל תלכי, עוד לא. משה הלר יצא בשקט מהחדר, וכשחזר הגיש לביתו ספל קפה וליטף את שערה. It is with a genuine delight that I am privileged to introduce Professor Susan Nyman. 
a leading intellectual of our age, Professor Nyman, the director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, has taken on some of the most pervasive issues of our age. Exploring diverse issues in moral and political philosophy, metaphysics, the Enlightenment and its discontents, and writing some of the most perceptive <clears throat> and complex work on problems of evil and memory, Professor Nyman has carved a unique voice in contemporary academia and beyond. Having studied philosophy at Harvard and the Fahr Universität in Berlin, and served as professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv, she's a philosopher who has taken philosophy out of the university halls and into public discourse, applying philosophical clarity and critique to contemporary politics, questions of building and growing up, and the construction of the ethical self, both in individual and public senses, grounded in the realities of modern societies. She has published scholarly as well as popular books, contributing op-eds to the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and essays in dissent and many places elsewhere. Among her books are Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, Mor <clears throat> Moral Clarity, A Guide for Growing Up Idealists, and uh, forthcoming, which we haven't seen yet, a book with a provocative title of Learning from the Germans, Race in the Memory of Evil. I should add that she was both admired and loved by Yeri, who followed her career and her writings closely, both on Kant and otherwise, and we are very fortunate and grateful for her for accepting the invitation to open this conference devoted to Yeri's work and beyond. Professor Neiman. Thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, when Jonathan did me the honor of asking me to give this lecture, I thought the most appropriate thing to do was to talk about the ways Yuri's work influenced mine. I was never his student, but I remember the excitement with which I read Kant and the Philosophy of History shortly uh, after it appeared in 1980. I was a graduate student at Harvard at the time, already committed to writing a dissertation on Kant, and I was hard-pressed to find Wahlverwandtschaft, and that's a nice German word which is usually translated as elective affinities, which is hard to make any sense of. Um, but what it means is the relatives you would choose if you got to choose your relatives. Um, let me recall how arid the Kant landscape was at the time. My own advisor, John Rawls, had replied to my proposal to study the unity of reason in Kant's work with his characteristic diffidence. I don't know if I can help you with the metaphysics, but I do know a little bit about Kant's ethics. Now, where humility is in short supply, it's easy to appreciate even its exaggerations. Those who are less humble, like Peter Strawson, wrote about Kant as a more or less worthy predecessor to their own analytic metaphysics. Curiously, few Germans paid much attention to Kant at the time. After the last great neo-Kantian Ernst Kassir was driven into exile, German philosophy seemed exhausted by the skirmishes between the semi-Hegelian Frankfurt School and the adherents of Heidegger. When I applied for a fellowship to spend what I thought would be a year in Berlin, 1982, it was difficult to find a professor who even taught Kant. In this barren field, Yeri's book was an incredibly welcome anomaly. It wasn't only that he shone a light on the ways in which history was central to Kant's work at a time when prevailing opinion divided philosophers into Hegelians who cared about history and Kantians who didn't even notice it, notice it so fixed was their attention on eternal unchanging laws. Yeri also talked about the role of God in Kant's work, a subject that Kant's readers since Heine were embarrassed to touch. Heine's view of Kant's relation to God became the standard one if nobody ever expressed it as well as he did in his history of religion and philosophy in Deutschland. So I want to give you a taste of this by reading uh, a passage from Heine. The only thing you need to know to understand this is that Lampe, who he refers to, was Kant's faithful student. So here's Heine. 
Gott ist verkannt anumenen. According to his argument, that transcendental being which we hitherto called God is nothing but an illusion. Let us write Dante's words, leave hope behind over this section of the critique of pure reason. You thought we could go home now? Not on your life. After the tragedy comes the farce. Up till now, Immanuel Kant had been the unrelenting philosopher. He stormed the heavens. He put the whole garrison to the sword. The sovereign of the world swims unproven in his blood. There is no more mercy, no grace, no reward in the next world for abstemious in this one. The immortality of the soul is in its last gasp. It rattles, it groans. And old Lampa looks on with his umbrella under his arm and cold sweat and tears run down his face. There, Immanuel Kant takes pity and shows he's not merely a great philosopher, but a good my man. And half kindly, half ironically, he says, old Lampa needs a god, otherwise the poor man can't be happy, but human beings should be happy in the world. Practical reason says so. All right, then, practical reason may guarantee the existence of God, too. In the course of this argument, Kant distinguishes between theoretical and practical reason, and with this, as with a magic wand, he revives the corpse of deism which theoretical reason had put to death. Did Kant undertake their resurrection not merely because of old Lampe, but because of the police? That's, uh, that's Heine. Uh, I wish we could still write philosophy that way. I mean it. Heine's view is wrong. But it's not more wrong than that of nearly every commentator on Kant's uh, view of God who followed him. It's just more fun to read. Yeri was an exception to the standard view. Of course, he acknowledged that Kant's epistemology rules out any positive theology. That's why Moses Mendelssohn called him the all-destroying Kant, a remark that wounded the sage of Königsberg, whose respect for Mendelssohn had led him to hope for a better verdict. Yeri wrote, and I quote from Kant and the Philosophy of History, as a postulate of practical philosophy, the statement God exists is equivalent to the statement that there must be something necessarily in the structure of the world or in man that makes the re realization of the highest good through human activity possible. End quote. This isn't theology, but it is central to Kant's work as I'll discuss later on. With God and History, Yeri's book was the first in a very long time, probably since Kassir, who did it differently, to suggest that Kant's work must be viewed as a whole. It couldn't be neatly divided into a theoretical part which had done away with metaphysics on epistemological grounds and an ethics which was rigid and puritanical. Indeed, between a thin and formal metaphysics and a thin and formal ethics, it was hard to imagine why any interest in Kant's work had survived at all, except as some positivist-leaning philosophers claimed to show that philosophy itself was bound for obsolescence. Yeri's description of Kant's conception of reason as not just about logos but about eros was liberating. Of course, as he wrote, many of Kant's expressions of an erotic glossary of reason should certainly be understood as metaphors, but metaphors for what, he asks. He doesn't quite say. But in describing reason as having aspirations, desires, needs, and frustrations, Yeri helped bring Kant's work to life again. Two German Kantians once told me, sighing, that Kant's work is as intrinsically exciting as Nietzsche's, but students just didn't get it. Now, as I said, I never took a course from Yeri, but I'll bet he taught Kant in a way that his students did get it. The first thing I did in preparing this lecture was to look for my copy of Kant's philosophy of history. I write in my books, uh, and I'd hoped to find some clues about what moved me specifically uh, when I first read it. But although I still have a, a full shelf of secondary literature on Kant, which I have lugged through several continents and will probably never read again, I couldn't find my copy of that one. I bought a new one, of course, uh, and read it last week. But it's now hard to pinpoint what exactly I took from Yeri and what I worked out on my own beyond this very general and welcome sense of Wahlverwandtschaft. 
I did look up my first book on Kant, The Unity of Reason, and I noted there were more citations for Yovel than anyone besides Kant himself. But rather than trying to tease out particular things I learned from him, I thought I'd spend the rest of this lecture by trying to lay out my own view of Kant and letting the rest of you decide how much of it uh, I got from Yuri and how much I didn't. Mm. Despite or perhaps because of the fact that um, I've taken to calling myself a recovering Kant scholar, I've written four books in which Kant plays a leading role. I don't think I've uh, repeated myself that much uh, for all these books focus on different problems, but all were in some way motivated by an attempt to understand two very weird notes in which Kant wrote autobiographically, the only words in which he wrote at length about the motives that drove his work. Let me read you the first one. I'm by nature an inquirer. I feel the consuming thirst for knowledge, the restless passion to advance ever further, the delights of discovery. There was a time when I believed that this is what confers real dignity on human life, and I despised the common people who knew nothing. Rousseau changed all that. My imagined advantage vanishes, and I learn to honor humankind. I should regard myself to be far more useless than the common laborer if I did not believe that my work would contribute to restoring the rights of humanity." End quote. Now, the quote may sound strange enough by itself, but it's much stranger if you couple it with virtually any random page of the first critique or most of Kant's other writings. You will ask yourself, if you open the book at random, what on earth do the meanderings of the transcendental deduction have to do with the rights of humanity? Nor do Kant's ethics provide an answer. Perhaps they contribute to humanity's general improvement, but improvement, of course, is not the same thing as rights. No wonder most commentators chose to ignore the note entirely, for taking it seriously seems to lead us to view the most important philosopher of modern times as a pretentious or deluded fool. Now, Heine also complained that the life history of Kant was difficult to describe since he had neither a life nor a history. Born 1724 to a saddle maker in Königsberg, he was saved from a craftsman's life by a local priest who made sure the boy got uh, the education none of, his, none of the rest of his family enjoyed. He climbed the academic ladder slowly and steadily till he became known as the sage of Königsberg, where he lectured six days a week on everything from metaphysics to military strategy. Until he reached middle age, Kant resembled nothing so much as Dr. Pangloss. The younger Kant really did believe that reason was in principle of unlimited knowledge, which would prove that this world is the best one. Heine's remark about his life was probably motivated by the fact you've surely heard, if you've heard anything about Kant, uh, his afternoon walk was so regular that his neighbors set their clocks by it. Only twice in his life did he swerve from routine, the first, the second time was when he heard the news of the French Revolution, uh, and the first was when he read Rousseau's Emile. Nothing else ever really happened to him. So an unlikely or revolutionary never lived. But despite this, he, would, he was called a fearless Jacobin by contemporary Prussians, and the same Heine who found Kant's life so dreary compared him to Robespierre, arguing that the philosopher was the more daring of the two revolutionaries. Goethe used another metaphor. Um, it's also not politically correct, but um, uh, I'll use it anyway because it says something. Kant free, you know, it says problematic things too, but Goethe said Kant freed us from the effeminacy in which we were wallowing. So what could a provincial German professor do to earn such a distinction? And to understand that question, uh, we need to look at the theoretical debates in which he engaged, 
What shook up Kant's life were intellectual commotions, not personal ones. These are viewed normally as debates about epistemology, theories of knowledge which wrestle with questions about how and how much we can know. Now, like most philosophers, Kant did spend some time trying to understand what elements make up knowledge, but questions about how much reason and how much experience go into what we know were never his main concern. The more important questions were not epistemological but metaphysical. At stake were the reality of ideas like universal justice and, on the one hand, and chimeras like angels and demons on the other. For the Enlightenment, it was just as crucial to defend the first as it was to debunk the second. People were still tortured for consorting with demons, while writers who denied the existence of such creatures could be driven into exile. And on the other hand, the belief that ideas of universal justice make real demands on the lives of everyone, whether commoner or king, seemed just as fantastic to conservatives as supernatural specters seemed to the left. Now besides Hume, besides Rousseau, Kant mentions one other major influence, David Hume, who he wrote awoke him from dogmatic slumber. Hume's provocative questions were deceptively simple. How do you know the sun will rise tomorrow? It can't be a matter of observation for what logic allows you to infer that the future will resemble the past. What about your belief that killing your father would be an unspeakable crime? This is not presumably a belief you learned from experience. Watch one billiard ball hit another and you'll say the first caused the second to roll, but where exactly is the cause when all you see is the conjunction of two unrelated objects? Now, skepticism about the limits of human knowledge is nearly as old as recorded human knowledge itself, whether you take it from Kohelet or the pre-Socratics, you're liable to conclude that certainties were always hard to come by and that life went on nevertheless without them. Doubt, even radical doubt, was part of any thinking person's territory. Nor did Hume think that doubt posed any threat whatsoever to ordinary life. All he had to do was leave his study and join his friends in a glass of sherry or a game of sheshbesh to watch his skepticism recede. What sustained him it was, the force, was conviction in the force of custom and habit, the source of whatever we take for granted. Now this appeal to tradition was itself part of tradition particularly that of the pagan Stoics Hume admired. What distinguished Hume from those Mediterranean skeptics was less the force of his arguments, although he was an amazing writer. I think he's wrong about almost everything, but um, uh, he's great to read. But it was less his writing than the context which stood behind them. Before the 18th century, human knowledge could seemed all of a piece. Metaphysics was no more and no less solid than physics, geography no shakier than geology, history no murkier than biology. Claims to knowledge were human claims, and like anything human, they were frail and subject to error. All that changed with Isaac Newton. The great Enlightenment poet Alexander Pope summed up his age's enthusiasm for Newton, which fell just short of idolatry, uh, you may have heard it, nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. Why did people feel this way? Well, where Newton saw chaos, where others saw chaos, Newton saw connections, joining heaven and earth in laws that govern both. Who before him even dreamed that the phases of the moons and the motions of the tides might be connected? Suddenly, all knowledge was not equal, for there was one science that seemed free of mortal failings. Before Newton, everything could be doubted. After Newton, the world could be divided into hard data and wishful thinking. Newton's physics set the standard for human achievement, and Hume, among many others, was unabashed about recording his wish to be the Newton of the mind. What he meant 
presumably, was the wish to discover a few laws just as indubitable and just as far-reaching for the universe within us as Newton had done for the universe without. To wish to be the Newton of the mind was not to wish to explain mental experience in physical terms. The search for naturalistic explanation was not yet a search for mechanistic explanations. Natural was the opposite of supernatural and meant something like law-like, but the type of laws which would turn out to be explanatory was not yet fixed. Hume wanted to follow what he took to be a Newtonian model and derive his certain truths only from that which was itself certain, namely the truths of mathematics and the most exact and scrupulous recording of experience. And following what he took to be that model, he reached bleak conclusions. Uh, look carefully enough at what is, and you'll see it isn't much. It doesn't include much by the way of law, either natural or moral, for it doesn't even include the principle of sufficient reason, the idea that what happens can be explained. What really is, is really meager. The rest of the cosmos, we populate ourselves with traditions and presumptions and other useful fictions. Whether ideas of justice or beauty, they are but human invention with no more force or validity than unicorns or elves. Am I speaking slowly enough for people to understand me? Yeah, okay. I tend to talk fast. I'm trying to slow down. So Kant acknowledges the, tr the thrust of Hume's point, namely the most important principles that govern our, our lives are not things we find in the world, but things we bring to it. In contrast to Hume, Kant insisted that those principles reside not in custom and habit, but in reason and understanding. He spent a lifetime setting out the laws and the rules that they follow. Now, the question that drove my own uh, first work on Kant was, why did he bother? So long as our worlds continue to turn as they ought to, why care if our conviction comes from reason or custom? The epistemologically focused vision that dominated Anglo-American philosophy for a century said that Kant worried about whether the world exists apart from our perceptions of it ignoring the fact that he wrote uh, that such questions are only of interest to scholastics and pedants. Kant's point is not to defend our traditional beliefs, but precisely to call them into question. On the difference between custom and reason, all the hopes of progressive politics turn. This was just the point of Edmund Burke's revolution, uh, reflections on the revolution in France which became the best known critique of the revolution, not because it was explicit about its abuses, the book was published before the worst of them, but because it had a systematic view of the causes, namely the foolish substitution of laws of reason for the time-trusted habits and customs of humankind. Burke was a disciple of Hume, who was just as cheerful a Tory as he was a radical atheist. Though Hume died too early to witness his century's political upheavals, he believed, consistently enough, in preserving the status quo. In attacking the very idea of revolutionary change, Burke's reflections drew out the implications of, of Hume's views. Demands for revolution, Burke wrote, arise from mistaken political metaphysics, which despises experience in favor of the abstract rights of man. Mistaken political metaphysics. Burke had been provoked by the steel and blood of Paris, but he focused on the far less tangible forces he saw behind them. He wrote that revolutionaries were at war with nature. Political institutions should never be based on ideas that spring from our feeble and fallible reason, but from the traditions and habits that have nurtured us for centuries. Like most conservatives, Burke uses rhetoric that presents his view as less a view than a mixture of common sense and common observation. Ideas and ideologies are something for liberals. Conservatives are just realists who are content to point out the way the world is, alas, perhaps, but that's just the way the world is. 
Burke's pleasure in ridiculing those he called bumblers and adventurers is a good way to obscure the fact that his position, too, is founded on a particular and powerful metaphysics with its own distinctive conceptions. What kind of a man, he thundered, would expect heaven and earth to bend to grand theories? Well, enter Immanuel Kant, who was perfectly willing to argue that sometimes there are ideas to which heaven and earth should bow. A year after Burke's book on revolution appeared, Kant published his answer in a pamphlet called On the Old Cliché, That May Be Right in Theory, But It Won't Work in Practice. It's somewhat disheartening to know that the cliché was old already in 1792. Kant wrote that conservatives like Burke are short on argument but long on tones of lofty disdain. They think it's enough to ridicule radical standpoints without questioning their own. Even more important, they fail to notice how much of our experience is constructed, often deliberately constructed, in order to perpetuate a social system that benefits the very people who say it's inevitable. And here's a quote from that essay. One must take people as they are, our politicians tell us, and not as the world uninformed pedants or good-natured dreamers fancy that they ought to be. But as they are, ought to read, as we have made them, by unjust coercion, by treacherous designs which the government is in a good position to carry out. In this way, the prophecy of the supposed clever statesman is fulfilled. I find that passage uh, just as uh, relevant at this moment in historical time as it was in Kant's. Um, by appealing to the sorry facts of past, past experience, empiricists turn contingent arrangements into facts on the ground. Anyone who tries to challenge them will look like she's challenging common sense itself. Kant was prepared to do that. Unlike Humor Burke, he was not content with a world that went on much as it had before. So he set out to construct a metaphysics that would ground Rousseau's hopes for revolution against those who championed the old cliche that ideas should take a backseat to reality. Kant's metaphysics was developed to maintain a balance between the actual and the possible and to ensure they have equal weight. As Kant saw it, the alternatives are few. You can declare that ideas are real and everything else is illusion. This, he thought, was the view of Plato's Republic, which went too far in giving ideas a sort of hyper-reality, which put everything else in their shadow. You can declare that only physical objects are real and everything else is illusion. This was the view of empiricists from the Greek skeptics to Hume. Uh, or you can take what Kant called the critical path and maintain that reality is made up of ideas as well as objects which are differently real and work in different ways. Objects are what the world is made of and much of Kant's metaphysics is devoted to explaining exactly what they are, but not because he's worried that they'll somehow disappear or that he's a Barclayan skeptic or he thinks, uh, you know, that the to use a famous example that captivated scores of analytic philosophers for decades. You might, you don't see all sides of the tomato at once, so perhaps it's not really there. Um, for Kant, objectivity is a literal notion. Objective is a word that makes sense when you're talking of objects and nowhere else at all. Nothing is objective but the brute and banal things we know through experience. The result is that Kant has the thinnest conception of objectivity in the history of philosophy. This leaves things less precarious than they may look, for God and freedom and justice are not the only things that are not objects. Consider the idea that everything happens for a reason, otherwise known as the principle of sufficient reason. Where did you get that idea? From the moment you learn that spoons drop to the kitchen floor when you open your fist to the day you're taught the laws of gravity, experience will have strengthened your conviction, conviction in the principle. But experience can't be the source of your conviction, for unless you presuppose the principle of sufficient reason at the beginning of your experience, you cannot even ask the question why. 
it structures our experience in ways even deeper than the ways experience is structured into causes and effects. The principle of sufficient reason is not something that can ever be known, but it guides our search for knowledge of whatever it is we do know. Scientists and children may come to the end of their investigation without ever finding out the reason why something happened this way or that, and yet none of their investigations could get off the ground unless they took that principle for granted, not as a matter of conscious choice, but as a basis for the structuring of reason itself. This means that in order even to understand experience, we have to go beyond it, working with ideas that experience may well support but can never confirm. Hume thought he was following in Newton's footsteps and proceeding with principles uh, based on mathematics and observation, but in fact, Kant said, Hume, on Hume's account of experience, neither mathematics nor observation could ever get off the ground. And with that insight, Kant's foot was in the door. For if hard science cannot function without ideas of reason that are not themselves objective, then objectivity itself has limits. Kant answered Burke's critique of revolution by questioning the general empiricism on which such critiques are inevitably based. Shall we reject ideas for the more dependable data of experience? But there would be no data of experience without myriad ideas of reason Science only works through a dialogue between both. Anyone who thinks we should judge ideas by empirical methods assumes that, as Kant said in that essay, we, should, we can see farther and more clearly with the eyes of a mole fixed on experience than with the eyes of a being that was made to stand erect and face the heavens." End quote. Now, there are all kinds of reasons to see Kant's views as a major source of progressive politics. His work offered a foretaste of international law, a vision of an organized United Nations, and a blueprint for social democracy. But none of these ideas are as important as his idea of the idea itself, for without this basic metaphysics, every demand for change can be dismissed as utopian fantasy. As long as your ideas of what's possible are limited by your ideas of what's actual, no other idea has a chance. Every proposal for change will be vulnerable to conservative head shaking. Things like freedom and equality may be very nice in theory, but the hard data of experience show they cannot work in practice. And Kant turns this whole very well-known movement upside down by saying, of course ideas of reason conflicts with conflict with the data of experience. That's what ideas are supposed to do. Ideas are not measured by whether they conform to reality. Reality is judged by whether it lives up to ideals. Reason's task is to, not, to deny that the claims of experience are final and to push us to widen the horizon of our experience by providing ideas which experience ought to obey, if enough of us do so. It will. Kant's idea, idealism emphasizes similarities between science and morality. Both depend on ideas of reason that are not themselves objective. But our obligations in science, of course, are very different from our obligations in morality. In both of them, we're naturally inclined to look for certainty. And his response is, you want to know things directly as they really are in themselves uh, without assumptions that constrain us. Kant thinks it's a natural wish, but it rests on a picture of knowledge that would only make sense for God. For the most important fact about human knowledge is this. Whatever the stuff we perceive turns out to be made of, it wasn't me that made it. Or any of you either, of course. Whoever created reality as a whole must know it with directness and immediacy we cannot even imagine, and even an atheist can agree on a version of that claim. For Kant, truth is neither truth in scare quotes or uh, Rorty's truth with a capital T. If our investigations are diligent and honest, they will usually yield the real thing. Our dissatisfaction with the limits of our knowledge is dissatisfaction with the human condition itself, 
and a barely concealed form of the wish to be God. But if Kant wants to stop us longing to replace God in matters of knowledge, he urges us to imitate him in matters of ethics. The categorical imperative is an invitation to imagine yourself at creation. Every time you act morally, you have a chance to begin a bit of the world afresh. This conclusion is so extraordinary that it's seldom been recognized, but Kant holds the wish to take God's place to be a natural one. It isn't the result of arrogance, but of the logic of morals. The moment you think that should not have happened, you've made a reproach, namely, the world is not in order and it should be made anew. Since the book of Job and any number of points in between, righteous men and women have longed to step in and change a piece of creation their good will is in their own hands, but the success of their good deeds depends on too many others to be under control. Kant's idealism is honest enough to embrace our ambivalence. We find ideals alternately illusory and frighteningly too real and too fantastic. We know they are substantial enough to die for, and we also know that people die for mistakes. If they make fanaticism possible, and frustration almost certain, why hold on to ideals at all? Far easier to downplay the realm of the ought and write it off as wishful thinking than to insist on its legitimacy. Realism thus considered is a form of laziness. If you tell yourself that a world without injustice is a childish wish fantasy, you have no obligation to work towards it. Resignation to the status quo was a stance conservatives supported from the age of enlightenment through the present, just as cynicism about the possibility of fundamental change was their most formidable weapon. Today, this blend of laziness and despair is more likely to be found on the left. Keeping ideals alive is much harder than dismissing them, for it guarantees a lifetime of dissatisfaction. Kant says ideals are like horizons, goals towards which you can move, but never actually reach. Human dignity requires the love of ideals for their own sake, but nothing guarantees that that love will be requited. Acknowledging that is crucial to growing up. Now, I hope the reading I've sketched makes it clear why Kant's first autobiographical note isn't deluded. There really is an argument that shows why the metaphysics of the critical philosophy provide the foundation for uh, universal human rights. The second note in which he mentions Rousseau, however, is even weirder, and I'll read this to you. Newton was the first to see order and regularity combined with great simplicity where disorder and ill-matched variety had reigned before. Since then, comets have been moving in geometric orbits. Rousseau was the first to discover in the variety of shapes that men assume the deeply concealed nature of man and to observe the hidden law that justifies providence. Before them, the objections of Alfonso and the Manichaeans were valid. After Newton and Rousseau, God is justified and Pope's thesis is henceforth true. Um, you may wonder for a start, who is Alfonso? When I set off to find out, I discovered a figure who confirmed my suspicion that the history of philosophy can be told as a history of the problem of evil. It makes less sense to say that philosophy began with Plato than that it began with the book of Job. I'm not going to tell that story now, uh, but it's worth knowing that the 13th century king of Castile was a recurring figure in philosophy up through this quote, which was written in 1765. While he's still known to uh, today in Spain as a precursor of the Enlightenment, he became famous for one thing only. After his interest in astronomy led him to study the Ptolemaic system, which was the best of his day, he said, if I had been of God's counsel at, the, at creation, many things would have been better ordered. Now, to medieval and early modern writers, this sentence expressed the essence of blasphemy. 
Was a Spanish king truly asserting he could have done a better job of creation than the Lord on high? The miseries uh, attending his reign, from a bolt of lightning to his son's own rebellion against the throne, were seen as divine and just punishment. Um, and it's fascinating to read all the people who said, you know, he got what was coming to him. Leibniz, however, used Alfonso as a sign of hope. From the benighted standpoint of Ptolemaic astronomy, the world did indeed look disordered, but thanks to Newton, we now know that the cosmos follows brilliant and simple laws. With a little more time, urged Leibniz, we will discover that the human world makes just as much sense as the natural one, and hence that creation as a whole is the best possible. Now, until he read Rousseau, uh, Kant was less sure. Half a century on, the patients Leibniz counseled while we were waiting uh, for science to show the relation between sin and suffering, that patience was wearing thin, and the doubts that began to swirl much earlier were brought to a head by the Lisbon earthquake. Why was a great center of European civilization, for Lisbon was that, until the 1755 earthquake destro destroyed much, most, most of it, why was a great center of European civilization brought low when it was no better or worse than London or Paris? Traditional answers to that question had been around since the Friends of Job, whom Kant, in a later essay, called scholastic metaphysicians. Even worse, he thought they were dishonest. Their defenses of God in the face of Job's suffering couldn't be genuine. They were made in the hope that God would be eavesdropping and reward them for their piety. Those defenses seemed increasingly thin, and the moral sciences, as they were called, were not showing anything like the same progress as the natural ones. Though the 18th century was dominated by discussions of the question, Rousseau was the first to treat the problem of evil as a philosophical problem, as well as to offer the first thing approaching a philosophical solution to it. Before Rousseau, thinkers were forced into one of two positions. To claim that this world is the best is to view all evils as ultimately apparent. Anything we take to be evil is ne as a necessary part of a greater plan. Leibniz thought we would someday understand it. Bale and Pope thought we wouldn't. They agreed, however, that there is an order which ensures that everything which looks like evil leads to a good of the greater whole. The result is that no particular evil is genuine. Everything we experience as evil works more or less like radical medical treatment by a competent doctor. As awful as it seems to the patient, all the alternatives are worse. This was called the doctrine of optimism, and Rousseau felt it gave optimists a bad name. For it seemed to am amount to straightforward denial. He also pointed out that such doctrines lead to quietism. If evils are merely apparent, and everything is the best that it could be, there's no need to do anything about them. Indeed, any action might count as impious, as many authorities use traditional theodicy to argue. This kind of <coughs> optimism not only precludes practice, but theory as well. All this left are orthodox claims that dissolve certain questions by fiat. If there is no genuine evil, how could there be a problem of it? Those who acknowledge that evils are genuine, on the other hand, found they literally defy explanation, as the French say, to explain is to justify. But if you cannot explain the presence of evil that Nietzsche called the metaphysical wound in the heart of the universe, you can't explain anything that really matters. The persistence of evil thus makes us doubt the value of reason itself. Before Rousseau, there were just two options. Either there is no problem of evil or there is no answer to it. Rousseau's ac uh, account vindicated God without damning humankind to original sin. Evil is our own doing, but we're not inherently perverse. The entire catalog of crimes and misfortunes can be seen as not fully intentional but mistaken. For Rousseau, human nature itself has a history. Our choices affect it. 
History is the right kind of category to introduce because it makes it possible to understand the world and give us hope for changing it. History leaves space between necessity and accident, making actions intelligible without being determined. If the introduction of evil was necessary, we can only be saved by a miracle. If it was an accident, then the world where it matters makes no sense. But history is dynamic. If evil was introduced into the world, it might also be eradicated, as long as the development is not fundamentally mysterious. So after Rousseau, we need not deny the reality of evil. We can incorporate it into a world whose intelligibility is expanding. Exploring evil as historical phenomenon becomes part of our efforts to make the world more comprehensible in theory and acceptable in practice. Kant saw Rousseau's view as revolutionary as much because it allowed us to state the problem of evil as because it offered solutions. The task was to determine a relation between moral and natural evils, between virtue and happiness, between sin and suffering, or risk acknowledging that the world has no justice or meaning. Rousseau was the first to assert a relation without calling it punishment, hence the first to see a solution which doesn't depend on miracle. He thus could avoid bad faith, a notion he more or less invented, and still affirm the glory of God. Rousseau never denied the depth of evil and enraged most of his contemporaries by showing they were both more corrupt and more miserable than they'd noticed. Yet his claim that such misery was a result of clear historical processes and could be undone by others made his work one long witness to providence. Thus, everything in Rousseau's world testified to creation. Raised as nature intended, the child would not be vulnerable to the evils of civilization and could play a role in constructing a better one. Kant compared Rousseau to Newton because both of them revealed the glory of creation. If Newton had revealed the physical order in a universe hitherto thought to be governed by patched together epicycles, Rousseau revealed a moral order in a world hitherto thought to be ruled by sin and suffering. Where earlier thinkers appealed to metaphysics and theology, Rousseau introduced history and psychology, using them to describe a world in which evil exists but isn't inevitable. Just as Newton had drawn causal connections nobody suspected, relating the movements of the ties to the phases of the moon, Rousseau linked the fables and food ingested in the nursery with the outcomes of the political order uh, and showed how both might be changed in ways that now seem obvious uh, to us now, but it hadn't occurred to anybody to suggest, for example, the child who's forced to sit still while his teacher drones on will become the adult who doesn't squirm on listening to a politician's empty lies. <clears throat> Uh, the child who has spoken to simply and sensibly will grow up to do and to expect the same. And if we're not condemned to endless sad cycles of custom and habit, we live in a world where justice is possible. I've sketched the argument very quickly, but I hope it was still clear enough to show why the youngish Kant, he was 41 when he wrote that note, youngish, thought Rousseau's account answered the objections of Alfonso, Rousseau defended providence by showing that it works. Uh, but those of you who know some Kant will know that the word providence does not appear in his later works. It's a paradigm of all the things that reason would like to know, but is absolutely beyond its bounds. So you may wonder. Kant may have thought Rousseau justified providence in his pre-critical youth, but what relevance does that have for his mature critical philosophy? And this takes us back to the questions that Yuri discussed at length in his Kant book, The Highest Good or the Goal of Human Existence. Kant thought all moral action has one goal, to realize a world in which happiness and virtue are systematically connected. Every time we act rightly, we act to bring the world closer to that. Take uh, any daily example you want. Uh, a child was killed through violence or neglect. A criminal betrayed his way into 
power uh, he enjoys without penalty or regret both happen every day, and still we're not too resigned to condemn them. What do you mean when you say that should not have happened? Kant says you mean that happiness and virtue should be systematically connected and the connection should be causal. Those who are righteous for the sake of righteousness should be blessed because of it. They deserve all the goods nature can bestow on humankind, not merely as the Stoics held satisfaction with their own righteousness. Those who are wicked ought to suffer not merely through the pains of tormented conscience, which they show little evidence of feeling anyway, but through something imposed by the world itself. The assumption that happiness and virtue should be systematically connected is so deep that it's seldom even stated, but Kant holds it to be at the bottom of every moral critique. Every moment of despair in the face of others' suffering, every expression of outrage at the sight of others' cruelty is based on conviction that the world should work on principle. For Kant, this assumption was neither foolish nor trivial, nor does it express an accidental psychological need of our species that might have been different. It embodies what he called a need of reason that's presupposed in every attempt to make sense of the world, and yet it's a need which can never be entirely met. The gap between is and ought is not accidental, but systematic. It's a gap which will leave us permanently torn. So Kant argued, we must believe that our efforts to be virtuous will be completed by a being who controls the natural world in ways we do not. We have no evidence that such a being exists, but only such a being could provide the systematic links between happiness and virtue that reason demands. Reason needs such a belief in order to maintain its com commitments to waking up ever again, whether through success or failure, to continue a moral struggle. Kant was sure that without some such faith, we would succumb to resignation at best and cynicism at worst. But here you may ask why Heine is wrong. Why isn't this just restoring faith through the back door after not denying God in order to make Lampa or the rest of us feel better? The crucial difference between this view and the view that Heine ascribes to him is Kant's conviction that we shouldn't know the connections between happiness and virtue that only a being like God could create. Leibniz hoped the progress of science would make all the connections between natural and moral evils manifest. Once we could see them, we would know in detail what we now know as a general principle. Others doubted that we would ever succeed in knowing the connections, but no one ever doubted that we should. People assumed we'd be less liable to despair and less prone to decadence if we were certain that the world works as it should. And Kant is nowhere more stunning than in denying all that. Knowledge of the connection between happiness and virtue is not only metaphysical, metaphysically impossible, but morally disastrous. And his example, uh, or my example, to support his point, consider your relations with people in power. You may want to compliment without meaning to flatter. How often can you forget the hope of goods they can bestow on you? What about the vaguer advancement which results from general esteem? Where the connections between good <coughs> behavior and its reward are obvious, only saints can act without instrumentalizing. The rest of us will calculate in terms of varying subtlety. Now imagine a world in which you knew what God knows, how every right action will be rewarded, every wrong one avenged. Could you engage in moral action, act out of pure goodwill? Kant says you couldn't, at least not consistently. Your relationship to God would be that which you have towards your employer, writ very, very large. If you're lucky, she has all the virtues and you may want to please her for the sake of being pleasant. But while she controls the means to your existence, you can never know that you will meet her without instrumental connections in the background. The analogy is imperfect only because the constellations are so different in size. 
In the world I'm asking you to imagine, we're imagining a relation between a being whose power is so absolute that he can right any wrong and reward any right and all of the rest of us. That's the fantasy that's expressed in almost every prayer. Were it to be realized, we would be undone. A morally transparent world would preclude the possibility of morality. So the best of all possible worlds is not a world we could live in, for the very possibility of human freedom depends on limitation. To act freely is to act without enough knowledge or power, that is, without omniscience or omnipotence, the qualities we ascribe to God. Not knowing if our good intentions will be rewarded is essential to our having them. If we knew that the world we we, is the world that we long for, human nature would change beyond recognition. Our behavior would probably improve. You'd be unlikely to commit a crime if you were sure the cosmic order actually worked. Some version of internal damnation would be enough to deter almost anyone from almost anything. But good behavior is not moral behavior, and the struggle to achieve the latter, which makes up human decency, would simply disappear. Our faith is not scientific knowledge, and thank heaven it is not, wrote Kant. Uh, it's a claim that's central to his work as a whole. It was widely and early criticized. Heine found it cheap, and the rest of the 19th century couldn't stand it. Yet thanking heaven for remaining inscrutable makes perfect sense. Providence itself requires that we cannot know it. Our very uncertainty about whether providence works as it should is one more testimony to the awesome wisdom which orders creation. Now, although it seems to violate some of the strictures of the critical philosophy, Kant continued to repeat some version of this argument throughout his life. Very late in the day, however, he makes a parallel argument suggesting that we might put history in the place of providence. In order to act, because we, we can get no signs from providence, or we get signs, or we think we see signs all the time, but that's another story. Um, so he argues that in order to act morally in the face of a world that seems to thwart us, we don't actually need to imagine a supreme being who could construct a just cosmic order. All we need to believe is a much weaker claim, namely, it's possible that human history is making progress. Hegel himself said that his own project uh, was just a better version of Leibniz's theology, uh, sorry, theodicy, replacing providence with history. Uh, Kant foreshadowed him here, as Yeri showed uh, early on. Tempted as we are to interpret every falling sparrow and bolt of lightning, Kant insists that we refrain from looking for signs of providence, but he acknowledged that humans need to look for signs of progress in history. Perhaps you've stopped caring about the systematic connection of happiness and virtue in your own case. You simply want your efforts to create a better world to show some fruit. If years go by and they never do, you're likely to stop making them at all. If, and only if, that happens, Kant says you're permitted to look for a sign, even while knowing that one sign of progress in one particular place and time says nothing about the course of history in general. The sign he chose was absolutely minimalist. Not the French Revolution itself, which could go either way, as Cho and Lai either said or didn't say, and maybe apocryphal, it's too soon to tell. But the hope which the revolution raised in the hearts of far off disinterested observers, like a self described melancholy philosopher in Konigsberg, is enough to show that human nature could be progressing to a better state. Let me draw a modern parallel. You probably don't remember it, but when Barack Obama was elected in 2008, the headline in Yediot was Hatikva. It's a whole page. Does anybody remember this? Good. <laughs> uh, 
uh, an Irish trad group wrote a song with the lyrics, uh, O'Leary, O'Reilly, O'Hara, and O'Hara, there's no one as Irish as Barack Obama. <laughs> and they've actually turned the birthplace of his great-great-grandfather on his f uh, mother's side into a national heritage site. Every country in the world rejoiced at the multiplicity of that promise that an African-American intellectual whose parents' marriage was illegal under the race laws when he was born could become president of the United States. I want to claim with Kant that that moment of hope for far off observers was itself a sign that humankind makes progress no matter what's happened afterwards. Kant is not Hegel. Progress isn't necessary, and just as much as regress, it lies in our hands. Now, growing up is a metaphor that Kant used for his own philosophy, and he returned to it often. What do you mean when you tell someone to be realistic? Um, I translate it as the advice to decrease your expectations, a suggestion designed to ensure that you get no more from and give no more to the world than those who came before you. It's a view that equates maturity with resignation. It urges you to, to accept the world you are given for any other standpoint is just the residue of youth youthful dreams. But Kant's insistence that human beings have limits is not that message at all. For Kant, grown-ups navigate a narrow way between hope and despair, and it's the recognition of how often we founder that saves this view from sentiment or kitsch. The demand is precisely not to abandon the ideals of your youth. Um, the abyss that separates is from ought is too deep to bridge entirely. The most we can ever hope to do is narrow it. Kant is the only major philosopher who insisted that reason and reality are utterly different and gave both equal time. Other thinkers tried to resolve the tension involved in living this way by, I've argued, um, downgrading one side or another and refusing to grow up. Conservatives like Hume refuse to acknowledge the reality of ideas which led him to a politics that accepts the world as it is. Hegel, in following him, Marx, saw the conflict between the real and the ideal at the heart of Kant's philosophy. Each tried to escape it by finding the rational real, both thought to escape the tensions that surge through Kant's work. These are not, he says, tensions that can be reconciled. Defending reason's right to make claims on nature validates our deepest longings. Whether or not we actually get them, we have a right to both justice and joy. It isn't childish to wish for a world in which happiness and virtue are in balance. When the righteous suffer and the wicked triumph, it's reasonable to rebel. What happens, happens, and it may often be execrable. But the demand to accept the world as it is is not a sign of maturity, but a sign of capitulation. The principle of sufficient reason is nothing but the demand that the world should make sense. So what do we do when it doesn't? Um, these are views I've held for a long time, um, and uh, at this moment in history, I know I'm not the only one who find them extremely hard to maintain. So I want to end by quoting my friend David Schulman, who I joined uh, this Shabbat in South Hebron. David has been working for 15 years with Tayush, which is devoted to working with and depending, defending Palestinians from settlers' attempts to take their land. In his new book, Freedom and Despair, Shulman recommends despair as a place to start. I know. 
<laughs> uh, but let me quote him. It's a good book. I can recommend the whole book, but let me end um, with a quote from that. If I use despair at a moment when I feel it most keenly, not expecting immediate tangible success in the task at hand, I'm likely to feel a little different, not so alone in the world anymore. It's hopeless, I'd say, but not in vain. It's not about anything but intrinsic goodness that sometimes infuses good despair, which transmutes itself into something that cannot be denied. Perhaps if I didn't despair, I wouldn't keep going down to South Hebron. I'd let others do it for me." End quote. Uh, Shulman doesn't know it. I'll have to explain it to him. But this is what Kant called rational faith. Thank you.